computing, I was an acting CIO, which is chief information officer. Everything just dominoed. So I think it was just a test and I failed. Normally I'm not a stupid guy, but in this case, <laughs> it's pretty stupid. Hello, I'm Joseph Wells, chairman of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Randy Pierce made some very bad choices, but basically, he was a good guy. In this 50-minute video, we'll find out what led him to gamble with his lifestyle and his career and lose. Here now is Catherine McLean, a member of the association's research department. Computer fraud may well be the fastest growing area of crime today. And some organizations make themselves easy prey because they give people like Randy Pierce too much authority. They, they basically let, they left it in our hands, the people that worked in IS, to be the guys to do anything and everything. And normally you don't do it like that. You don't have everyone having total power. Giving employees too much power leaves the door open for fraud. According to the undercover high-tech officer who investigated Randy Pierce's case, let's call him Detective Bradley, companies which ignore basic information security will inevitably have problems. It's like a direct correlation. The less money and time they spend on security, the more ton money and time we spend investigating crimes after the fact. Unfortunately, difficulties arise for investigators not only with maintaining the integrity of computer evidence, but even with knowing the basics. Walt Manning, a 20-year veteran of the Dallas Police Department and former member of its high-tech crime unit, explains. Imagine getting a 911 call and getting a uniformed police officer when you've had a computer file stolen. The officer comes in and he says, hey, you know, I'm here to take your report. What's been stolen? Really? You said our client See, list in 1999. He says, OK, what was the point of entry? Because he's taken a million burglary calls. And you tell him modem port number 19 is the point of entry. He doesn't know what a modem port is. For computer fraud investigators, understanding the basic schemes is the first step. Computer fraud schemes can be separated into two general classifications, fraud by computer manipulation and fraud by damage to or modification of computer data or programs. Damaging or modifying data is a common tactic of external computer fraud perpetrators. It can take several forms, as can the motivation for the offense. Quite often, the motives are economic advantage over a competitor, theft of data or programs, holding data for ransom or bit napping, or sabotage. Thinking of computer crime as strictly white collar may not be accurate. Manning describes just some of the criminal offenses in which computers play a role. We have organized crime using this technology for the same reason that it makes business sense to do it. It's cost effective, it increases the efficiency of their operation. We've had drug dealers using cell phones and pagers and computers. We've had prostitution rings using computers. We've had burglary rings keeping track of every job they've ever performed and every item that was stolen in every job on computers. Uh, it involves our entire society, and to limit that to the viewpoint that it's a white-collar crime is really cutting the computer fraud problem very short. We will look at the computer fraud problem from an external and internal point of view. The external fraud schemes we will discuss are telecommunications fraud, hacking, internet fraud, and software piracy. The starting point in all of these schemes is direct or covert access to a computer system through the introduction of malicious software or programs. Common telecommunication fraud schemes are PBX fraud, voicemail fraud, stolen long distance calling cards, and cellular telephone fraud. The advent of cellular phone technology has created a new arena for theft and abuse. A scheme gradually being combated is known as cloning. Cloning is a method of stealing cellular telephone data and numbers using basic scanning equipment. By monitoring cellular traffic frequencies, perpetrators obtain and use victim cell numbers. The benefits to the scheme are twofold. The fraudster avoids phone charges and his call cannot be traced back to him. 
The latter benefit is of particular appeal to organized crime. Stolen numbers are an easy resource for untraceable calls. Prevention for telecommunications fraud includes the use of personal identification numbers entered by users when making calls and radio frequency analysis. Each cell phone has its own signature radio frequency emissions. These can be monitored to ensure that emissions match those assigned to users' phones. Organizations which provide cell phones to their employees for business are advised to incorporate them in their security plan. Again, include your telephone systems and your telecommunications assets in your security plan. A lot of companies don't do it, and they're leaving the door wide open to fraud. In the last 20 years, hackers have developed a subculture complete with their own jargon and hierarchy. In this community, a claim is won through performing difficult hacks and avoiding detection and capture. A common image of the hacker has been one of a reclusive genius breaking into networks for the challenge, according to Walt Manning. Most of the ones I dealt with were teenage kids that were doing it as a challenge. It was a, uh, they were challenged by the technology and to make the technology do what they wanted it to do. Defacing websites is the main preoccupation of this type of hacker. Government and industry sites are frequent targets. At the Department of Justice site, they were putting swastikas and hate crime messages up there. And, you know, very embarrassing for the United States government. But there's been college websites, company corporate websites. Uh, there's actually a site on the Internet that you can go to that documents all of the websites that have been hacked. Uh, and they show you graphics in many of the cases of what it looked like before and what it looked like after they finished. And again, you know, we get back to that bragging rights mentality here. They like to show their work to show what they are capable technically of accomplishing. It gets them prestige in that community. But Manning thinks that now a new type of hacker is appearing on the scene. Now we're seeing a change in that. We're seeing a lot of hackers now that are becoming professional hackers and hacking for, for money. In the past, it was just for the challenge of the technology. They caused a lot of damage and, and destruction, but now there's money to be made by hacking, by penetrating, by stealing proprietary information. The theft of proprietary information to American business has exploded over the last year alone. If such hackers are caught, going to prison is often just a finishing school. Don Parker, computer security expert and author of Fighting Computer Crime, explains. And in the past, uh, one of the purposes or one of the benefits of, of going to prison is that you learn from the other prisoners what you did wrong in your crime and you learn how to correct that and how to do it better or you learn how to do new kinds of crime. So it's an educational experience, it's graduate school of crime. As Bradley the undercover detective tells us, graduating from this school puts most hackers way ahead of the competition. I've always been aware that the hackers, the people that sit at their computers for 18 hours a day are well ahead of whatever we're going to try and do to, to stop them. Um, we just have to get lucky and exploit those opportunities where they make a simple mistake, where they leave something to identify them. The hacker's first hurdle is gaining access to the system. Obtaining a valid user ID and password is therefore often a necessity. There are basically two approaches. The first involves the use of programs that try combinations of letters in high speed until a winning combination is found. Some of these programs are electronic dictionaries and war dialers. With these in place, a hacker can gain remote access to a system in a relatively short period of time if proper security controls aren't in place. The other approach is aimed at obtaining access information through deception. This concept has come to be known as social engineering. One of the more common social engineering scams is impersonation. Posing as a new or temporary employee, the hacker calls the organization's information systems department in the morning. He explains that he can't start work without system access, and most likely, someone will furnish him with a user ID and password. Another technique takes advantage of the anonymity that is inherent in large organizations where not all employees know each other. Posing as someone in a position of authority, the hacker calls information systems, saying he has a problem logging in. 
He demands a new user ID and password. Again, if strict security policies aren't in place, the hacker might actually be given what he asks for. Posing as a technical support employee is also effective. Many hackers choose to target lower level or new employees for this one. The hacker calls the victim and citing some system problems, asks the user to log off the system. Okay, when they log back on, the hacker asks the user for their name and password to verify that it's now running properly. False advertising is a tried and true social engineering trick. A phony website advertising internet service is a common vehicle for this scam. Also common is a fake phone number. In either case, victims are given an incentive to sign up, usually free online hours. They fill out an account setup form, giving employment and personal information. They are then asked to give a user ID and password. Nine times out of ten, they will use the same ones that they use at work or at home, providing the hacker with exactly the information he wants. Most people's password combinations are ones that would take a dedicated hacker with an auto tiler practically no time to crack. In order to choose safe passwords, users should avoid actual words. They're just too easy to guess. But passwords need to be at least six characters, eight or better. Combination of letters, numbers, and special characters like punctuation makes it better. Also, passwords should be changed frequently. Security policies which prohibit sharing passwords are another step in the right direction. And many employees write down their passwords just in case they forget them. This should also be avoided, says Manning. I did an audit one time in response to a challenge. I found 75% of user passwords within 10 feet of each workstation. Employees must be educated that passwords are sensitive information. Making them easily accessible puts the organization and the employee in a vulnerable position. If an organization doesn't have such policies, gaining access to its networks could be pretty simple. The Internet provides millions with tremendous business and learning opportunities. Hand in hand with the apparent benefits, however, comes the risk of being scammed. I'd say that, that you really have to pay attention to the Internet because it's bringing such new opportunities that uh, for old traditional crimes, we're seeing a resurgence in some of the old scams, the pyramid fraud, the investment scams. You know, oil and gas, gold mines, ostrich farms. We're seeing those types of investment swindles out there now. The National Consumer League's Internet Fraud Watch says complaints about Internet fraud schemes have increased astronomically in recent years. They list the top 10 schemes as follows. Online auctions, general merchandise sales, internet services, hardware and software sales, pyramid and multi-level marketing schemes, business opportunities or franchises, work at home plans, advance fee loans, credit repair, and false credit card offers. While few of them are new, the internet provides these schemes with a means of reaching a wider audience and more victims. And the internet makes it easy for them to appeal to, to, appeal to a global pool of potential victims. Before, they could only target limited groups of possible victims. Now they can send out bulk email to millions of people. And if they only get a 1% return on that, it's still a tremendous rate of return, and everything's profit because it's all fraudulent. Most pyramid schemes found on the Internet masquerade as no-risk, easy investments with huge returns. Victims find out otherwise. The fraud schemes that I've seen really are investors being, and most of them are pyramid, Ponzi type schemes, where the, uh, the fraudster takes the money and never really intends to give the, the investor anything in return. There for a while he's paying as long as he can continue to add people to this pyramid, but once that reaches a point where it starts collapsing, then the investor's left holding the bag. Most of the accounts that I've read from the SEC fraud aren't because the investors underestimated the response. It's that the investors started off with a fraudulent intent from the beginning. Buying and investing over the Internet can be risky if consumers don't take the proper precautions. Victims are taken in by a professional-looking website and assume the operation is legitimate.
I can put a picture of a, of a office tower up there and say that it's the world headquarters for XYZ investing. How are you going to know that that's not true? It creates that mental perception in the victims that it's a reliable, large organization that will stand behind what it's telling them. Yet often, this proves not to be the case. Because you don't know who you're dealing with anymore. The internet is really faceless, and it's anonymous. And I can impersonate you very easily, technically, on the internet. And who's to know the difference? Since policing of the internet is very difficult, victims often have little opportunity for recourse. This is especially true if the perpetrators are in another country. And I actually had a case I guess about 18 months ago with a fraud, two local companies lost about $24,000 worth of property, sold to Moscow, Russia, to this same address, five or six different occasions. And I took the report from the victim companies, but explained that, you know, the chances of anybody being arrested in a foreign country is pretty slim. Consumers are advised to do some checking before they invest. You have to do your homework. It's no different than going into a CPA or a professional here in Austin or in any other city. You want to check on their credentials. You want to see what their background is, what their education is, see if they have any Better Business Bureau complaints. There are now Better Business Bureaus on the Internet. Uh, check them out. Check out. Do a little homework. Don't just take them at face value. And particularly on the Internet, you have to be a, exert a little more effort to make sure you know who you're dealing with. Software piracy is one of the most common and costly forms of computer fraud. Don Parker says that in the end, legitimate software buyers foot the bill. Well, the, the last I heard of the level of uh, software piracy going on uh, uh, around the world was about 13 billion dollars uh, per year. And uh, I continue to be amazed that the software industry remains as viable as it is. And of course you and I are making it viable because we have to pay this additional increment for all the software we buy to pay for all the software that the software companies otherwise lose through, uh, through piracy. One of the most common forms is employees copying software at work for use in their homes. Another common scam involves counterfeit software licenses. People that are criminal have decided that they can photocopy those documents and sell them for $5, $6, and then they might sell on the open market for as much as $500. Anywhere you have a big gap like that, there's a great chance for counterfeiting and piracy. Since most built-in software protection is ineffective, Parker says that for many organizations, the solution is an emphasis on doing the right thing. Therefore, it is a, a change in uh, behavior uh, and in how we look at information as a valuable asset, and in particular computer programs, as a particularly valuable form of information that has to be treated with care and that we have to pay for uh, what we get. Internal fraud has plagued employers for years. And while computers allow employees to work more efficiently, they also give dishonest workers a perfect tool for fraud. Internal computer fraud frequently takes place in the form of computer manipulation. The schemes themselves are of the same nature found before the advent of computer technology. They include billing schemes, inventory fraud, payroll fraud, skimming, check tampering, and register schemes. Basically, any job function for which an employee uses a computer is a potential avenue for fraud if the organization doesn't take preemptive safety steps. Investigating these computer-assisted internal frauds means knowing what to look for. Think about the old fraud where you had uh, the fraudster keeping two sets of books. You have one ledger here that's available for public inspection and another ledger that he hides away to keep the real fraudulent uh, enterprise under wraps. Now you do that all on a computer, in a spreadsheet. You have a different file. You encrypt it. How many auditors or investigators are going to know how to look for that type of information? 
and know what the signs are. Recognizing which employees are at risk of committing internal computer fraud is another important step. Employees who are frustrated with their jobs and have a financial need are naturally more likely candidates. This was also the case with Randy Pierce. So my expectation through a couple of years was that I would be steadily increasing salary-wise, and it just wasn't increasing at the rate I expected. And I'm not normally that type of person anyway. Um, I really feel like my boss is always going to take care of me. If I do a good job, which I try my best to do, that I should never have to worry about it. In most cases, that I hadn't had to. Um, in this case, it was just you know, frustration then. Under the right conditions, an honest employee will turn to fraud if given the opportunity. There's those extraordinary circumstances that turn an extraordinarily honest employee into somebody that would hurt the company. In Randy's case, a financial need suddenly arose which he couldn't ignore. So then, you know, I get this thing in the mail from the IRS, you know, this, this is back in, probably started in 95. Um, with a, a huge delinquency, you know, $15,000, $14,000, something like that. It is exactly this kind of combination of pressures that can push employees toward insider fraud. He uh, had a lot of financial pressure because of a tax lien filed by the IRS. And uh, for those of you that ever had dealings with the IRS, they don't like to wait for their money. The vast majority of high-tech offenders like Randy have several things in common, says Bradley. The average employee in my personal caseload has always been a male. I can think of only one or two cases in five or six years among four or five detectives that were females. Uh, can count them on one hand, definitely. Whereas the other 150, 200, 300 were, were generally males between 20 and 30 years of age. Uh, oftentimes there was symptoms that something should have been noticed because they were flashing large sums of money, wearing clothing and jewelry above their means, driving cars above their means. Living the high life is an obvious warning sign of employee fraud. Clever offenders will conceal their illegal wealth, however. Since companies are most vulnerable to computer fraud by insiders, the question remains how organizations can protect themselves from fraud by their employees. Bradley says the answer is to invest enough resources in fraud prevention. The more brain power they invest in making sure they are safe, probably the better off they are. Uh, and it's kind of a tough call, you know, being in the outside, being in the police world, I can't tell them how much is enough, but it's usually very evident, uh, you know, the number of times they have to call for help, you know, as that goes up, probably the amount of money and time they're spending on security is, is way down there. Every organization is concerned about protecting itself from inside as well as outside attack. The difficulty with forming a security plan is that every organization has different vulnerabilities. There is unfortunately no product or plan that covers all contingencies. So identifying which areas of the organization's information assets need the most protection is the first step. Walt Manning talks about a useful instrument in this process. One of the big tools out there right now that will help you determine how much vulnerability there is to your particular network are network security scanners. These scanners identify the various vulnerabilities and they test for them and then they recommend solutions. If they find a vulnerability that they know there's a known patch published to fix it, they'll tell you. They'll even give you the URL usually to go out and obtain that patch. An important consideration in building defenses against internal fraud is predictability, according to Parker. The strongest point uh, to make about computers is, in a sense, they are predictable. That is, a computer given the same input will always give you exactly the same output. They are repeatable.
Humans are not like that. A human will never do exactly the same thing under the same circumstances. And therefore, people represent an unpredictable element in crime. Uh, so uh, if a criminal is attacking a computer system, they will be able to predict exactly what that system is going to do it, throughout the entire crime. Knowing exactly how an organization operates is of tremendous benefit to both inside and outside offenders. In Los Angeles, there was a, um, uh, a uh, $21 million bank fraud, an ongoing bank fraud. And uh, every Friday afternoon, this uh, bank uh, branch bank manager uh, would uh, move uh, money from a number of accounts into the, his favored account where his accomplice was drawing the money out. Had a bunch of shortages in these accounts. But he knew two things because he'd worked in data processing in that bank. And he knew there, were, there was a $1 million floor limit control so that any transaction over a million dollars was audited. And he also knew there was a five-day rollover limit. That is, you could keep a, a suspense item open for uh, just five days. What finally ended the scheme was something the fraudster couldn't predict, human error. Well, this one Friday afternoon, he made a mistake, and the change in an account was more than $1 million, than the uh, floor limit or transaction limit. And the next Wednesday, auditors showed up at his branch saying, hey, we have to check out the transaction. But the key point here is that he knew exactly how those controls in that system worked. They were predictable. And therefore, he was successful in his crime. And the only reason he got caught or the thing fell apart was that he could not predict that he was going to make an error. Parker describes some of the relatively simple security controls the bank could have had in place to prevent the theft. If they'd used a random number generator and made this floor limit a different value, uh, and you could do that second by second even, uh, making a different value so that no human knows what that value is. And if you varied the five-day limit uh, in such a way that no one uh, would know the, the next week what that is going to be, then uh, you would have made the crime extremely difficult for that individual to, uh, to engage in. While unpredictability is of great benefit, still the most important element of any information security plan is employee cooperation. But Parker explains that despite security awareness programs, employees would generally rather avoid security measures. I can't stand the constraints it imposes on me and my work in keeping my clients' information secret. If I didn't have to do that, I could perform at a much higher level. This was perhaps also the sentiment of Randy's employer, Power Computing. Their focus was on sales to the exclusion of security. And they were selling computers. They weren't selling piece parts. So they didn't care about piece parts, you know, at all. They don't make any money off piece parts. They make their money off selling computers. And in most companies, employees receive no reward or even acknowledgement for observing security measures. What gets them a salary increase? What gets them a performance uh, advance in their organizations? Uh, a higher level of output, of productivity. And if they can eliminate security, they can raise productivity. The answer, according to Parker, lies in giving employees an incentive to follow security guidelines. What motivates employees is the potential for job advancement, for increased salaries, increased income, that bonus at the end of the year, and therefore we have to relate better security and adhering to the controls that everybody hates. Uh, associate that with what people do to be rewarded in their work. But how can employers link job advancement with security in the minds of their employees? The answer that Parker developed is surprisingly simple and effective. 
there needs to be a line item in every employee and manager's review, annual performance review, that says what are you doing to protect this organization's information and uh, financial assets. And until we have achieved that level of applying the motivation for security, you can forget that we're ever going to have anything but superficial uh, surface level security. It, it's in name only. People will go about it, make it look like they're doing what they're supposed to do for security, and at every opportunity uh, they will avoid, uh, find a way not to, not to do it effectively. To illustrate what can happen when organizations ignore basic computer security, let's return to the case of Randy Pierce. Randy began working at Power Computing when it was a startup company, performing a number of different tasks in the information systems department. And at first, all was well. So yeah, we're pretty proud of ourselves as a group being able to do that. Um, like I said, working for a startup company's got a lot of rewards, or can have a lot of rewards. But soon, Power Computing's disregard for controls began to alarm Randy and his staff. It's just the, the, the normal controls that you, you checks and balances that a company puts in place, power just didn't do that. And it was rampant across the board. It wasn't just accounting, it was inventory, it was sales. I mean, it was so wide open, it was sort of pretty scary. And, and quite frankly, I've told them, and my staff have told them many, many times that, you know, we're doing things we shouldn't be doing. Randy also realized that his hard work was not getting him the benefits he expected. Power Computing's managerial style frustrated him, and he felt let down when he didn't receive the rewards to which he felt entitled. I had been here over a year and you know, kept the company afloat, basically, me and my staff, and you know, really felt like we did a good job. And I made sure all my employees were rewarded well. So I was kind of, my expectation was a lot higher uh, than I thought what, what would happen to me. So I had a terrible review, and, terrible raise and so I was really upset. Adding to his financial pressure was his debt to the IRS. And I finally get you know some notices in the mail that they're fixing to you know garnish wages and levy liens against the house and stuff like that. And when Randy learned his wages were to be garnished he got desperate. He turned to an old friend in the computer resale business, Larry Reeves. And so you know I'm in one of these like scared modes where I don't know I don't know where to turn. I can't turn to my family. My family doesn't have that kind of money, so I can't turn to them, and nor would I probably want to turn to them. I'm just not that way. Um, so I called a friend of mine up, and you know, Larry and I have been friends for years. I said, hey, can you loan me some money? I said, yeah, I can loan you some money. Larry Reeves lent Randy about $5,000. After sending the money, however, Larry began pressuring Randy to return the loan. When Randy couldn't do so, Larry started asking Randy for another kind of compensation. After I got the money, it's like, okay, I need my money back. <laughs> well, I don't have the money. He said, well, maybe you can find something within the company that we can, you know, work on some, you know, scrap parts or some, you know, obsolete materials or some stuff like that. And said, you know, I don't deal in that stuff anymore. You know, I can turn you on to the person that does, and you can call and talk to them, but, you know, I can't do any of that. Larry kept up the pressure on Randy to send him some power parts. Faced with wage garnishment from the IRS and disappointed with his job, Randy eventually caved in. It's just, and we battered back and forth. You know, it's like, Larry, I can't do that. I can't, you know, like, and on and on by that. I get another threatening letter from the IRS, and you know, and you get this 2% raise that you expected an 8%. So, you know, you, so all that compounds everything, clouds your judgment. It's fine, just say the hell with it. Okay, I'll send you some stuff. Then you send them something, and it's like, well, now I've got some. Now I need more. Randy ended up making two shipments of 500 parts each to Larry and sending the parts was as easy as entering a sales order. So you just go do it, create an order, put it in there, saved it, press the button, everything started, you know, just let everything go, flow. I didn't do anything else unique.
to make it happen. It just, you know, the guy down in the warehouse printed out something that said this on it, and, you know, he went and executed to it, shipped them off, and things were done. The parts themselves were very distinctive. There were pieces that Power put directly into its computers, stamped with the Power Computing logo. Randy warned Larry that the parts would have to be broken up. Larry seemed to agree. Nobody else in the world wants these but Power Computing. So they're, you know, they're built specifically for power, you know, all that. So if you try to sell anything back to power, it's going to be pretty obvious that uh, you got them from some source that you shouldn't have got them from. He said, well, I, you know, I don't care to do that. All I want to do is take the memory chips off and I'll sell them the, the DRAMs or the memory chips uh, by themselves. The scheme was simple. Larry would find buyers for the parts and split the profits with Randy. But after making the shipments, Randy didn't hear from Larry again. He tried to forget the incident. But several months later, Bradley received a phone call from Power Computing reporting what they thought was a theft. They had a phone call. Uh, the man that was in charge of buying and selling their electronic parts to make these computers had a phone call from a company up in Dallas offering to sell Power Computing a large quantity of computer memory product that happened to have the Power Computing logo on the part. Given Power's control deficit, they might never have noticed the theft had it not been for that phone call. I mean, it, it didn't sound like there was any reason anyone needed to go do any investigation with, without someone calling saying, here, I've got some parts, I want to sell them to you cheap. Bradley began the lengthy process of investigating and reconstructing the trail. Part of the difficulty he faced was that the parts in question were hard to trace. Memory modules are a type of product that is not serialized. They're just, they're like uh, pounds of coffee beans. There's just a lot of them. It doesn't mean that if I find you with 50 of them that I can prove they came from the missing 5,000. Memory modules are like that. Bradley called the company in Dallas, which reported buying the power parts from another dealer. He traced the parts through five other sales until he found the one he was looking for. Asked him where he had gotten these power computing modules, and he said that he had bought them from a man who he had done business with for a number of years, 10 or 15 years. The seller was, of course, Larry Reeves. Despite Randy's warnings, he'd sold the parts without breaking them up. The buyer told Bradley he'd had misgivings about buying the parts, but Larry convinced him they were legitimate merchandise. And uh, he said he was curious about this sale because these were brand new pieces and it was a technology that was very, you know, very much in demand. And he told the seller, who happened to be a man named Larry Reeves, you know, I really hope you've got an invoice to document, you know, where you got these parts from because this is the first time you ever brought me anything new. And Mr. Reeves assured him that, oh, yeah, I got these from the company and they were overstock and, you know, I've got my invoice. While insisting the deal was legal, Larry nevertheless asked the buyer for a favor when making out the check. Larry asked him to make the check out in the name of Kawana Reeves, and Kawana is Larry's college-age daughter. So Larry was smart enough not to put that check for $52,000 into his own bank account because that creates a paper trail. Bradley's next step was getting in touch with Larry. He left messages for Larry for several weeks asking him to call. And. Uh, Luckily, one day he called back and you know basically wanted to know what it, you know what was I trying to uh, ask him about, and I explained that I was just trying to track down these power computing uh, components, and he assured me on the telephone that these were parts that Power Computing, the company, had sold to him, and that they had sold these parts to him because he was going to try and find out if he could have them manufactured uh, at a cheaper price in the Dallas area. Larry assured Bradley that the deal had been legitimate, and when Bradley asked Larry for an invoice, Larry agreed to send it. Randy, who hadn't heard from his partner in crime since sending the parts, got a panicked phone call from him now demanding a phony invoice. We later found out that the, the fraud was created because I was applying pressure to Larry Reeves to come up with an invoice for these samples, and he put the pressure on Randy Pierce before Randy was terminated you need to create an invoice because the police want to see an invoice. So they actually built that document just for my uh, satisfaction, basically. Shortly thereafter, Randy left Power Computing. The company was shutting down and gradually letting its employees go. And due to Power's poor division of duties, 
Randy was the only one who knew how to search Power's system for the evidence Bradley needed. And unfortunately at that time, they were using a very antiquated uh, mainframe, and only Randy Pierce knew how to make the mainframe run. Bradley says that at one point, Power employees felt so helpless they suggested calling Randy in to help in the investigation. At one point, we even were asking to find out if Randy Pierce could come back to Power Computing maybe at night or on the weekends and help us load these backup tapes so we could find, you know, who had done these things. Unable to reconstruct the trail of events through Power's resources, Bradley took another route. He had Larry's phone records subpoenaed. And it was very easy. There was only one number of Power Computing he was dialing around the time these parts were delivered, and that was the voicemail of, Larry, of Randy Pierce. Next for Bradley was the phone call to Randy. Literally just call Randy Pierce out of blue. Hi, I'm with the Austin Police Department. We've got a problem power computing. He said he was aware of it. And what I often tell people, and I, I think this is really the truth, I just think they've made a mistake. You know, I'm not going to come out and tell somebody you're a bad person, you're a crook, you're a thief, you're a liar, because why would they want to speak to me much longer after I've spoken to them in that manner? When he got the call, Randy at first denied his mistake. He told me who he was and said, would you like to talk about this thing? And of course I said, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Rather than using high pressure tactics, Bradley suggested that confessing would make Randy feel better. It worked. So he just said, you know, it might make you feel better if you could get things off your chest. And said, well, I don't have anything to get off my chest, of course. And yeah, you know, it was just shakes. And it's like, I didn't know what to do, didn't know what to say. So, you know, I just pleaded stupid for, for a while. And then, of course, gave me a couple of days to think about it and called me back and told me. Said, yeah, you're right. It's going to make me feel a hell of a lot better just to get this off my chest because it's just been killing me anyway. In a confession statement to the district attorney, Randy explained how he'd used his knowledge of the system to commit the crime. Power Computing's controls were so lax that by manipulating the credit limit, Randy was easily able to prevent expectation of payment in accounts receivable. So he set it to a million to ship the merchandise. He set it back to zero so that it wouldn't show as a completed sale. Therefore, there was no invoice sent. Therefore, Power Computing's not going to be asking questions 45 days later when the bill's not paid. Nobody's going to wonder, well, where's this money? So that's where you have to have somebody that knows exactly how this thing works to leave fewer traces. Despite Randy's extensive knowledge of the information system, he would probably not have been able to pull off the theft if it weren't for the major gaps in Powers' controls. Bradley says the worst of these oversights was giving one employee too much power over business operations. Anytime you have that much power in one employee's hands, you know, there's only one person that can make the system work. You need to make sure you know who that person is and you know that you can trust them every day because they can do things that you can't do, you know. The CEO doesn't know how to run the mainframe. Some salaried employee knows how to run that mainframe. And if he doesn't take care of your interest every day, you're in trouble. Another weak spot in Powers Controls was a general lack of concern over employee activities. Security policies were ignored, and checks and balances were non-existent. So the, the, a lot of the normal check and balances that you have in a company, whether it be accounting checks and balances, whether it be inventory checks and balances, a lot of those just did not exist. But they were real sloppy, so in, in reality, anybody could enter an order. In Bradley's experience, it is exactly this kind of sloppiness in a company's controls that can lead to internal fraud. The motivation sometimes begins with kind of an innocent um, sloppiness in the workplace where the companies may not have super strict standards about what can be done with one piece of property or two pieces of property. When we talked with Randy, he was still awaiting sentencing. Uh, I've offered, you know, to pay back everything, um, whatever they want, whatever they, you know, I've already told them, whatever you come up with is what I deserve. Stay on the camera that, you know, it's power computing's fault, or it's the IRS's fault, or it's Larry Reese's fault, or, you know, any of that stuff. It's not. It's my fault. 
You know, what I did, I did by myself, and I take responsibility for my actions. Larry Reeves, however, was less upfront. He decided to evade arrest. He was eventually caught and also pleaded guilty. And it turned out that he'd been scamming his partner throughout the entire incident. Larry Reeves never told Randy Pierce he had sold those parts. L uh, Randy Pierce thought that Larry was still trying to sell them. Randy Pierce was promised half of whatever Larry Reeves made. Randy Pierce was only paid about 5500 and we know for a fact that Larry Reeves made 52000 on one check. We haven't yet proven what did he do with the other $100,000 worth of components, but I will promise you he sold them for $50,000 also. So Randy Pierce, who lost his job, who, you know, uh, was guilty of this crime, got 5000 and Larry Reeves probably got about 100000 Larry Reeves and Randy Pierce, two computer fraudsters who were caught, are serving 25 years in a Texas correctional facility. But how many offenders just like them and your organization get away with it? Checks and balances, proper controls, and a good information security plan can immeasurably help organizations in preventing internal computer fraud. And finally, remember that computers don't commit fraud, people do. Don't leave the door open. For the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, I'm Joseph Wells. After finally dealing with them, even I finally got it resolved with the IRS in 98. Uh, it's an error on their part. They owed me $2,000. 